Thanks for that piece of shit, Lieutenant, that's always uh, on his podcast. Bash us, f him. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to New York's finest retired unfiltered podcast. This is 265 Police Live. I'm everything your most complaint cop, NYPD. Along with me is the founder and the co host of the podcast, of course, John McCarry, retired lieutenant, NYPD. What's up, my brother? Doing very well this morning, my friend. Excited to have our good friend Paul join us. Outstanding. Along with us is Paul Maticone, retired lieutenant, who's been behind the scenes and recently joined the team of New York's finest retired unfiltered podcast. She does the video production. Paul does an outstanding job. You can find him at Just Right PD. We got a good, good round table today. I think it's going to be a good one. We're going to talk about car pursuits. It's a hot topic in the NYPD right now. Actually, it's a hot topic throughout the entire country. So, John, want to start? Sure. I mean, uh, so basically what happens, we have a 600% uptick in vehicle pursuits in the NYPD. Uh, press starts coming out, asking questions. What's going on? What's going on? Chief Shell, who is the chief of patrol, newly appointed, there's been a 600% increase since the time he was appointed, starts doing a media tour saying, we're not having it anymore. We're not going to take it anymore. With that, a couple of major vehicular crashes happened. Some people have lost their lives. Me and Eric have been speaking out against it, um, saying that we don't believe that it should be part of the policing strategy. It never was. And and to do it in this time is is crazy. Um, with that being said, after a few crashes, Chief Judge Rudy Madri put out a, a, a memo stating to read the patrol guide procedure, which me and Eric both say that 99.9% .9 of these pursuits violate. Um, speaking with Paul Manicone offline about vehicle pursuits, I believe we're, we're definitely around the same um, thought of it, but Paul's from a different generation of cop, different era of policing. He retired in 2008, came on in 1992, um, you know, totally much different NYPD in 1992 than it is today in 2023. So, Paul, what are your thoughts on Chief John Shell's comments about we're not going to take it anymore? So I'm kind of split on this because you're right. Things have changed since when I was on the job. Cops weren't getting indicted, getting indicted the way they are now. They weren't uh, getting jammed up as we say, as easily as they are now. Um, he, the reason why I think he took a lot of these guys with little time on is so they can be molded to what he wants. I don't believe it was just because they had a lack of CCRBs. I believe it's because they can, they're maybe a little bit naive and they could be manipulated in a sense. However, I've been saying for years that even when I was on the job, we need a, a somebody in upper management to lead us and say enough is enough. It's one thing if your sergeant says, I'll back you or your lieutenant or your CO. But when you have a three star chief saying, you know, you guys basically can go out and do police work. That's what Giuliani told us. And it made us feel good. Like we had the backing. The job wasn't going to screw us. And we got rid of a lot of the crime that way, right? Through broken windows. And obviously there was bail and things were a lot different back then. <laughs> so it's good and welcome news to hear someone that high up to say the party's over. We're going to, at some point you have to take back the city. And I don't want cops getting in trouble and getting jammed up, certainly getting arrested, you know, or, or faced with a trial, but it's still nice to hear that, Kind of, we have your back uh, if you want to do this, if you want to go after these guys, because at some point you have to say this needs to stop. You know, I agree uh, to a point. It sounds great. It's a feel good story. There's there's a man, you know, standing on a soapbox and acting like a cowboy saying, listen, this time is over. We're going to take the city back. It feels great. The NYPD says it's going on offense, targeting dangerous criminals that try to run from police. We are not letting you walk away. We will be compassionate. We'll be kind. We'll give people breaks. But breaking the law, guns, shootings, gang members, robberies with these cars and bikes, we are not having it anymore. It sounds good. But to me, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what's just on the surface. And we need to 
we need to really dig below the surface and we need to peel the layers back before we can actually do that. And the other problem I have is that in order for the cops to effectively address crime and actually increase public safety, there has to be a clear vision. There's not a clear vision right now. There's a complete separation. There's a dichotomy between what Chief Madry is saying, who's the chief of the department, and Chief Shell, who's the chief of patrol. So in order to be effective, there has to be a clear mission. It has to be a clear vision. The cops have to know that the entire upper echelon has sent a message, but the message is is blurry right now. Chief Madry is saying when you're at a riot and bricks are being thrown at you to handle it in a delicate manner. He's advising the cops that if you engage into a pursuit that you could possibly be terminated because now the disciplinary matrix has been revamped when it comes to this particular procedure. And if you engage in a pursuit and there's aggravating factors, you could be terminated. And then we have Chief Shell, on the other hand, who's saying, go out and do this. But the, the problem and what I see below the surface is that he's talking to two police departments. He's talking to the guys in the khakis right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's telling the guys in the khakis right now, go out there and chase these cars. You can do it. I got your back. You're with me. And Chief Madry is talking to the guys in the blue pants. Hey, the guys in the blue, don't do it. That's the problem. It's not a clear vision. Yeah. If you, if, go ahead, John. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. That's all right. Go. Say what you're going to say. I was just going to say, if you're split, all right, and you don't have one, one vision, not just within the department, but the mayor's office, and the DAs, right? If you're, we had a couple of cases DP'd, right? But now it seems like Bragg won't prosecute anyone unless you're white or Donald Trump. I just had to say that because we all know it's true, but there, it's selective enforcement. And number one, that kills morale because you really do risk your life. You risk your job, you risk your freedom. And if you get a gun off the street and they just don't want to indict it for the hell of it, like that cop that uh, needed 20 stitches, he was bit, right? No bail. So what is, that sends a terrible message to your, to your police officers that are out there risking all of this to get the, the, the guns and the drugs off the street. And, uh, and you need backing, not just from within the department with Madry and Shell being on, this, on the same page, but you need the DA to back the police, you need the mayor, you need the city council. The media will never back us, so that's, that's, a, you know, that's a lost cause. But there are certain elements that would make this, you know, operation uh, flow a lot better if we had everybody on board. But you're right. I believe it starts at least within the same agency. We have the chief of department saying one thing and the chief of patrol saying another uh, that, that they need to fix that. And the commissioner should should be all over that. I haven't heard him talk about it. You know, I, that's you know, but that's the whole thing. I, I agree with you, Paul. I think that. Chief Shell's message is refreshing to hear. And I always like to hear rah-rah speeches. I do. And I like to see, like, I know the guy was the police. But I, I my, me personally, I think he's selling out the younger cops. And I honestly think that he's selling out public safety in New York City. Um, because, again, I don't want my children getting run over by a two-year wonder doing a vehicle pursuit over a temp tag. And that's basically what he's saying. We're not going to have it anymore. People aren't running on the police. And I don't think that we're addressing the root cause of the problem. Like, why do you guys think people are running from the police? Like, why, Eric, why do you think people are running from the police today? Why didn't we have the problem before? I'm so happy that you mentioned that because I always believe the same thing. We always have to get down to the grassroots and figure out cause and effect. How do we get here? How do we get to a point that that we have a three-star chief, chief of patrol, actually addressing car pursuits as part of a policing strategy, part of intrusive police work. How do we get here? That's what I'm saying. That's where I think we need strong leadership. I think that right now, his leadership, it sounds great. It's, it's feel good, but I think it's poor leadership. I don't think it's weak leadership, but it's poor leadership. Why? Because he's sending the message to, he's putting his cops in a position to be casualties. And how do we get here? Is because of legislation, because of the politics, because of the media. All the laws have been stripped back and handicapped the police from doing their job. And now if you actually get into this position, get into a car pursuit, you could possibly face termination with this disciplinary matrix. And you know what? You'd be lucky if you face termination. What you really have to worry about is civil liability and paying out of your pocket for the rest of your life 
and then actually sitting in jail because cops are getting indicted throughout the entire country in democratic cities. And not only do they get indicted, they get in charge and they get sentenced. Just for a cop in Minneapolis who was sentenced for one year because of car pursuit that, that was bad and went ugly. The 40-year-old was driving home in July 2021 with a green light at Lindale Avenue and 41st Street when he was hit by a speeding Minneapolis police cruiser driven by then-officer Brian Cummings. He's never coming back. That's my oldest brother. I love him to death. Cummings was chasing a robbery suspect. According to prosecutors, it was James Jones Drain, who's now also charged with causing Frazier's death. He blew through the red light first. At his sentencing hearing, after pleading guilty to criminal vehicular homicide, Cummings apologized to Frazier's family. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge the great pain and suffering that the Frazier family is experiencing. I'd like to also offer my most heartfelt apology for the untimely death of Mr. Frazier. And I pray that the Frazier family will be able to find a space of peace and healing soon. Prosecutors agreed to a plea deal to give Cummings probation instead of prison time as the first Minnesota officer to plead guilty to a homicide charge without taking a case to trial first. Frazier's family said they understood, but they still want to judge Tamara Garcia to give Cummings the maximum 365 days in the Hennepin County workhouse. He deserves more than what he's getting, you feel what I'm saying? Why should he be out free while we out here suffering? Let him sit there and think about what he did. Judge Garcia decided on a 270-day workhouse sentence instead. In Frazier's family, left the courthouse disappointed. That's a slap in the face. Jones Drain is set to stand trial in August for his alleged role in Frazier's death. He's also charged with 13 robberies. And so this is what I say. I like to make this assimilation. When I talk about casualties, I was in the Marine Corps. It was understood when we go to war that we may have to be put in a position that is just completely a losing situation, not winnable. But it's in order to actually win a battle in war. And it happened in World War II with the Marines, where the Marines came out of amphibious vehicles and had to climb up a, a hill. And, and the Japanese are firing down that hill at the Marines. And it was a lose-lose situation. But we had to fight that. And the, and, and the country knew we would have casualties to try to get us into a position to fight this war. So what Chief Shell is saying is, hey, this is necessary, but we're going to take some casualties. And when the casualties means... Cops are going to lose their jobs and they're going to go to jail. Yeah, we didn't have that fear in, in the 90s. And, and I will say that I think we're all looking at the big picture. It's just we look at it a little bit differently. Um, I think what I'm getting from you guys is the big picture is it sounds great and it is great until a car jumps a curb and kills some kid in a stroller. Okay? I agree with that. But – I look at the at the big picture and a little bit differently saying, yeah, that like you just said, we might have to take some casualties and those would be terrible situations. But big picture, crime is out of control. And it's out of control, not because of the police, but because of the people above them. When the DAs don't prosecute, when you have no bail laws, when you have the city council looking only to hammer cops, the city turns into uh, the ghetto. Even the nice places are going south now, right? But when you look at the way they go into these businesses and clear all the shelves and you say, well, we're not enforcing petit larceny. We believe in the broken windows theory. Even the small crimes matter. You know, we're not going after rapists and people who murder. They're throwing these cases out. Big picture to me is at some point, we have to get our city back. And the way you do that, I don't like the cowboy mental mentality. I don't like that he has young guys doing it. I wish he wouldn't even mention foot pursuits, uh, vehicle pursuits. I wish he would just say, listen, the, the, times of, uh, the time of uh, committing crime in New York City is over. And why make the vehicle pursuits even an issue, right? Because, because it is an issue. And, it, and it's, that's going to give – that's more fuel to the fire. It's, it's going to be like you were saying uh, Letitia James has now this task force to look at this one specific issue – if the guy runs, what would be the solution? Just let him drive away? You know, I think that we're having vehicle pursuits the same way that we're having resisting arrest pop up. The same, same way that we're having people attack cops 
popping up. It's more frequent now than it's ever been yes. because we removed the fear of the police and the fear of consequences. And my thing is this. I understand what you're saying. Like, what should we do as cops? What should we do? I mean, the public would expect us to go get a bad guy, right? They would expect us to do anything we can to put that person in jail, right? Not risk the public's life to do it, but they would expect us to have resources to do that, that people wouldn't be able to run from us. But at the end of the day, what happens to these people? What is the incarceration rate? We've seen all of these pursuits end in vehicle crashes, and not just with the cops and the perpetrator. They're hitting civilian vehicles. They're running curbs. They're hitting into park cars. They're damaging city property. I mean, and, and at the end of the day, for what? Why are we really doing it? Because no one's being incarcerated. Literally nobody. And, I, and, that's, my, and that's my big problem is like, you, you were there. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, was, I was getting in trouble at this time. I wasn't a cop. But the Giuliani era, I don't believe that vehicle pursuits were considered a tool. I believe the majority of those pursuits were called off. I would say the majority of my career, overwhelmingly 90% of the pursuits were called off. Well, I think it depends on each situation. When I worked, when I was a cop, I worked midnights in the 2-8. There was nobody on the road. So if you saw someone, even if you went to a, into the 2-3, the 2-5, the 3-2, you could go down Frederick Douglass Boulevard. You can go down 7th Avenue. And there's no, there's very few people on the road. That would be different than chasing someone during school hours in the middle of, you know, Manhattan or uh, near a school, wet pavement. You know, the weather conditions have to take be taken into consideration. So there are different factors that, you know, you hope some of these people have common sense enough to say, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Now, you can't win in this situation because if you go after someone, let's say the guy's got a gun, I would go after him, right? Paper plates, expired tags, all that other stuff, I wouldn't. But, uh, but if you know that the guy has a gun and you try to get this guy and he doesn't pull over, if you continue to pursue him and he, <laughs> God forbid, kills someone, you're wrong, you're sued, and you're probably going to go to jail, right? You'll, you'll be at least prosecuted. But if you let the guy go, and then he goes a couple of more blocks, and then he goes and kills his wife with the gun that you knew he had, that you saw him possess, they're going to have a field day with you because they're going to say, officer, you knew this guy was armed. You knew that uh, uh, he was using evasive maneuvers to flee you, and you let him go. And he went, and now we don't have his wife here anymore because he, he shot and killed her. So you're going to get sued and you're probably going to get prosecuted for that as well. So it's almost like, like you just said about Madry and shell it's do this. Don't do that. It doesn't matter which lane you choose. There's always going to be something waiting for you to hurt you down the road. And it's not worth doing that. If they're not at least prosecuting the people that you catch, that was what is different from when I was, uh, much younger in, in the early 90s. We didn't have that. You got the guy. Most of the time they they prosecuted him and um, and we had the backing, not just of our job, but in the courts. Very few cases were DP'd or declined to prosecute. Believe me, I, I get it. No, we were all cops and we were all cops that actually enjoyed doing intrusive police work. We were out there. We were in the streets. We didn't take the job just for a paycheck. We actually wanted to pursue the bad guy. And, and I'm going to say it right now. If I was in a patrol guard right now with, with John or yourself, Paul, I'm pretty sure if we pulled the car over and they took off on us, even after we had this podcast yeah. and we've been saying this constantly, we would probably take off after him. Right. But here's the problem. Every time we do that, we're rolling the dice. And what I'm saying is right now – before this podcast, there was no one out there to educate the young guys right now. They are putting themselves in a horrible situation, and they will be casualties. I mean, could you imagine? You get a job right now. Could you imagine I say, Paul, John, listen, you're going to become a New York City police officer. Right now, crime is out of control. You're going to be putting khakis. You're brand new. You're going to be putting khakis. You're going to be in the specialized unit where you don't have the experience. You're going to go out there and pursue the bad guys. They're going to take off on you, and you're going to pursue them. And some of you 
are going to lose your job, and some of you are going to end up in jail. Let's say we have a group of 20. 10% of you are, are losing your job. 10% of you are going to jail. Hey, but this is what's necessary so that we get the streets back. Are you doing it? John, are you doing it? Paul, I mean. <clears throat> no, but I think that's the other problem that we were talking about or that I mentioned before. The climate to indict cops and to, in every single turn, not just in the media, but, you know, the ADAs and, and, and all of these uh, units that want to hang cops, it wasn't really like that um, back then. If you gave that speech today, you know, nobody would sign up for that. That's why they can't. That's why you have first grade detectives on foot posts, right, John? Because nobody's taking the job anymore. You have and, guys in your most elite units. That's right crazy. Now, standing a foot post. The most elite investigative enforcement units, first grade detectives standing a foot post right now as we speak on the streets of New York City because the manpower is so low and they were still not willing to talk about what they've done in the last three years. Now, what, what do you think that that cop's not staying past 20? If I'm a first grade detective and you're putting me on a foot post, I'm counting my days and then I'm out the, out the door. Well, and then you're losing more people of that caliber. I, I think I, I see. I think the opposite. I think that guy will stay more because he's going to make three hundred thousand dollars this year. Oh, with overtime, three hundred and thirty thousand dollars this year. So those are the guys that are going to be more apt to staying. The people who aren't going to stay are the people that actually go out on the streets of New York City every day and answer these nine one one calls, and the people that show the presence every day, which are the patrol cops. The, the men and women inside of precincts, inside of transit districts, and inside PSAs. And that is the majority of the job, not those in the specialized units. Right. And that's who you lost. And you lost their voice. And those are the people that are going to leave. And they're not even staying 20. They're leaving before that. You have people resigning. I had a my friend of mine just retired as a sergeant with 19 years and one month on because he couldn't deal with it anymore. Wow. And there's no mental health uh, uh, help, right, for that? That, yeah. that's that's another thing that changed it wasn't like that with, with us it was talk about your problems call employee relations we have counseling and how dare you um you know treat someone differently just because they're going through a mental health health crisis and now that's changed too so the whole climate has changed so so drastically i feel like shell implementing this policy is maybe 10 years too late. I feel like this would have been a great thing to do before the crime got out of hand, but I still question, what do you do? So what do you do? I, I just want to ask, because Eric brought up a great point. Eric brought up a great point with his training. And that's why you would never be in charge of training in the NYPD, because you would actually give these cops a moral knowledgeable, reality-based perspective to go out there and police. So I'm going to ask both of you, Eric, I'll start with you. What does this statement mean to you? Because this is what it says. A vehicle's <laughs> pursuit must be terminated whenever the risks to the member of service and the public outweigh the danger to the community if the suspect is not immediately apprehended. What does that statement mean to you, Eric? And when would you feel comfortable in pursuing something based upon the the the, the 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 patrol guy. What what it tells you about vehicle pursuits? I think I, I think that statement is clear as day. It's car chases are a no no, and I, I've said this before. I I assimilate car chases almost as as we use our firearms. It's a last resort, and I would say right now, if someone kidnapped a kid, kidnapped a woman, absolutely. I would engage in that pursuit. If someone is hanging out the window, the pastor window, someone's hanging out a back window with a machine gun, with a, with a, with a, with an automatic rifle and they're firing, it's some type of mass shooting and they're actively shooting people. Anything short of that at this point with the knowledge that we have, I would not engage to a pursuit. I would, you would right now, you need the discipline to actually stand down. I know it sounds crazy and it hurts me to say that because I was out there. You could ask anyone doing intrusive police work. We were getting guns, chasing people down. And yes, I engaged in some car pursuits. And every, after, every time I did a car pursuit, oh my God, thank God that went well. But 
There wasn't New York's finest retired and filter podcast to educate the guys out there. There was no one telling me, like, you know what? This is why you don't want to engage in these pursuits because you'll end up in jail. But that's what we're telling people. And no one – and at the time, we also didn't have the disciplinary matrix. Now we have the disciplinary matrix. That's another Bible form document that could have you terminated. So, again, I'll say this. Kidnapping, I'm on board. Someone's actively shooting out the window? Yes. Now, if someone just has a gun in the car, I'm going to tell you right now, do not engage in that pursuit. Stand down. Because if you chase that car down, and right now it's summer, it's busy streets and throughout the five boroughs, and someone is pushing a stroller, a carriage, and you kill that kid, according to the patrol guide, you should terminate it because that outweighs the violence that you could have with that gun in the car. If two gang members shoot each other, all right, it's unfortunate. Yes, we lost a life. But does that outweigh a five-year-old in the street? No. The five-year-old's life outweighs these two gang members killing each other. So it's a no-no. Absolutely, that's what I say. So when I hear that, I think the reason why they put that language in there, I know that you're saying it's crystal clear. I agree with you. But I think they're vague on purpose just so they could have enough language in there to hang the cop. If they gave you concrete criteria, if they said, do not pursue like that other bill, uh, the other video I did uh, in, Wa in the state of Washington, you can only pursue if you have probable cause and you had a list of uh, like 10 items uh, on a violent felony list. If they said you cannot pursue unless someone committed a, a, an A felony or B felony, or you cannot pursue during school hours, the cop can go into the trial room and say, this guy committed an A felony. This guy shot someone. Or, or uh, there wasn't school hours. It was 3 o'clock uh, uh, in the morning on a Saturday. And be exonerated. They don't want that. They want to they wanna make it as ambiguous as possible just so they leave it up to you. Because at the end of that memo, it ends by saying, uh, or, or that part starts with, the following should be considered. They're leaving it up to the cop only so the cop could, could then be questioned and they'll, they'll sit at a round table and say, well, you know what? You use poor judgment and now, you, you know, you're, you're terminated or God forbid, you're, we're going to try to, you know, we're going to go after you and prosecute you. So they use that language on purpose, not to benefit the public, it's to hang the cops. And they did a similar thing in, um, in Chicago with Mayor uh, Lightfoot when she was still mayor. Uh, about not just uh, vehicle pursuits, but foot pursuits. Chicago leaders responded to calls for change following the death of 13-year-old Adam Toledo following a foot chase by Chicago police. Now Mayor Lori Lightfoot is calling for a foot pursuit policy. Too many young people have been buried in this community. She said she wants changes in place by summer, saying it's one of the most dangerous parts of policing. Every loss of life in our city is tragic. And here, involving a 13-year-old boy, evokes even more pain. And they put it in writing. And the reason why they put it in writing is so they could hang the cops. So they could hold up the piece of paper and say, you didn't, do, you didn't comply with item number four. It's not meant to keep the public safe. It's meant to hurt us. That's where I think their intentions are. I agree. I think that, I think that it's what we're doing now is just destroying proactive police work. And I think that Chief John Shell's statement actually is going to accelerate destroying proactive police work. And I think that there will be legislation looked specifically at vehicle pursuits to because of their will. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that if it happens, I'm saying when it happens, these kids will jump a curb and kill and kill an innocent civilian. And it will be all of the news. And every member of city council, every member of state assembly and attorney general will be looking to throw these people in jail, including the sergeant and lieutenant who should be doing their job. And what's their job? What are we always told? Protect your men and women, protect your cops, protect them not only from the public and the bad guys, protect them from themselves. So I get you. Yes, it should be in the cop's head when they're when they're about to engage in a pursuit. And would you hear almost every time a pursuit comes over, Central, show me following a vehicle, right? Because they don't want to say they're involved in a pursuit. Slow, slow right? rate of speed, yeah. Right? Well, show us a fall at a slow rate of speed, right? And then, Central, what's going on? Automatically, that's a vehicle pursuit. That's getting keyed in as a vehicle pursuit. What is he wanted for? All the time. Silence, right? Yep. Uh, uh, 
possible GLA central, possible GLA central, right? Possible GLA, right? What does he want it for? He's wanted for right now. I have no, I have no idea. He just took off on me. And that is 99.9% of the vehicle pursuits. And what John Shell saying is that's not happening anymore. We're not going to call off those vehicle pursuits, but it's not on the, it's not on the cops. He's telling the lieutenants and the sergeants, you're not calling that off. Even though, regardless of that situation, because that's who ultimately calls it off. Because let's face it, like Eric said, when you're in the heat of the moment, boom, there's a million different factors that are going to keep. You might think he has a gun in the car. You might have information that whatever's going on. But you don't know specifically. And even if you have probable cause that there's a gun in that car from CI information, at the end of the day, you don't know what that DA is going to say. Oh, he didn't know. It's defensive that he didn't know the gun was in the car, even though it was his car. Someone accused him of stealing the gun. It, you, know, you, you have no idea what's going to happen in that situation. So everything, almost 99.9% of those vehicle pursuits, unless the guy's shooting out the window, kidnaps somebody, it's a terrorist act, and he's using the vehicle as a ramming pursuit, I think all of them should be called off. And I think that's clearly what that says in, in the patrol guide. I, I think it's so ambiguous that, that it's so clear that it's saying, don't change the laws. You know, what we also have to think about in this climate, you know, we talk about it all the time. What are we actually pursuing? Because we know there's going to be no prosecution at the height of bail reform, at the height of raise the age. This wasn't a car pursuit, but it makes me think there was this one kid. I don't want to give his name because he's he's considered juvenile because of raise the age. But he was part of a gang called the Jack Boys, which was in the confines of the 4 old precinct in the South Bronx. And it just totally destroyed these neighborhoods. They were just completely, uh, everything was drug facilitated. They were involved in all, in most of the, the gun crimes that would happen to 4 operation. This one kid in particular, the height raised the age, was involved personally where he fired a shot at other gang members six times in a calendar year. And finally, at the sixth time, he actually was incarcerated and sentenced after, after his adversary met his demise. That was six times he fired a gun in a legal firearm in New York City until he was finally sentenced and put in jail. So now we're pursuing cars that potentially may have a gun in the car. But let's say straight, someone has a firearm in the car and you pursue that car and that car gets to a crash. It just only causes property damage and nothing happens to you. What has happened to that perpetrator in the car with that firearm? No bail, no prosecution, and it's probably not even going to make it past the hearing. And now, forget about the whole idea of going to jail, but now they cause property damage. You're the cop. You're going to face a lawsuit, and you're on the hook for civil liability. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> that's, that's, the other, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the other part that we were talking about. You need, it's not just the police department. You need the DAs to actually draw up these cases and prosecute these people. My question for you guys, excuse me. <clears throat> what would it take for you to get on board with, uh, Chief Shell? I think might be a little extreme, but he does sound like a cowboy. I wouldn't make those statements in public. And, um, you know, if you want to say that on, you know, uh, behind closed doors that we got to get these guys. But, um, what would it take for either of you to, what would be the first step to taking back the city? Would it be the DAs? Would it be getting rid of, you know, some of the, the nonsense that goes on at CCRB? What would it, what would it be? John, you mind if I jump on this one? Yeah, go. Okay. So instead of hearing John Shell saying, this is what I expect from my police officers. This is what I want at this point. I would like to see a coalition with the commissioner, the mayor, Philip Banks, the real police commissioner, chief of the department, the chief of patrol, New York City Council, CCRB, the five borough DAs standing together and every one of them saying, we will not tolerate this anymore. We are going to take the streets back. We will not prosecute our cops for, for, uh, and substantiate civilian complaints and hold them back from doing their job. We, the New York City Council, are removing the diaphragm law. We, the five borough DAs, will not pursue police officers 
to to enhance our careers. We, the New York City Police Department leadership, are getting together and we're making a coalition to take the streets back. That, I think, is where it needs to start. John, you agree, right? I mean, there's nothing better than that. I agree a thousand percent. And just just to add to circle back on what Eric was saying about that that incident when you crash and it's just property damage, CCRB is going to find you guilty. So you're going to be civilly liable. But whether that happens or not, whether CC, let's say like, let's say this is one of the rare occasions where CCRB won't find you guilty and the city doesn't indemnify you. Let's just give it that example. You still made this perpetrator a rich man. Yes. You still made him a rich man. You still made him a million dollars. You still made him a million. He's going to have more money in the bank than you're going to have. And you risked everything. You risked your life. You risked the public's life. You risked all of that. And I agree 1,000%. Where the hell is the police commissioner? Where the hell is the chief of department? Why is John Shell speaking out on this as the chief of patrol? When did we ever hear from the chief of patrol? You hear from the chief of detectives sometimes because no one wants to go up and give bad information about a case that we only have very limited information in the information age. So they throw the chief of detectives up there or some poor inspector that has, you know, they got all this. Hey, yeah, you tell them what happened. You know, we had traps <laughs> and over six minutes and they, they leave those up. They'll, they'll leave those press conferences for the chief of detectives. But other than that, you never hear the chief of patrol speak in policy, right? Crime fighting strategy and policy. But not only do we we only hear from him, we don't hear from the other two other than, hey, hey, this is when you'll do it. Other than that, call it off. You know, so I agree with Eric. It's 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 much bigger on a political spectrum. And if we're truly going to fight crime and take the city back, it has to be done with politics. And it's like, hey, what do you want us to do? Where where every one of these situations where someone's arresting, it looks like we're playing patty cake with with the with the uh, a, fight, a fighting perpetrator and that's based off the policy and the legislation of the police department that's based off the legislation that city council passed and the nypd policy that sometimes is more restrictive than the legislation that the, the, that the, the progressive left and city council passed and it's the same thing it needs to come from the top a whole collective and if and again at the end of the day if i'm the mayor i'm going to say right now you will only engage in in, in, in in vehicle pursuits in extreme extingent circumstances. And that is it. I don't, we will get these people and they will be prosecuted. You know, those people that we seen at the riot the other day, we're going to identify them on the video camera and you're all getting arrested and you're all going to jail. But we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. There are tons of people in that riot we have identified. We're not doing anything to them. We're not even, we're not arresting them. Then we're not doing anything. And that's the path to public safety, not vehicle pursuits, so that the cop could get declined prosecutions so that we could put him in the early intervention program because right. he has to be in a 12 month period. Right. Yeah. You, you do need, you need all <laughs> these other people helping and all these like Eric, if I don't think I'll, I'll ever live to see that day where the five DAs come together and say that we're done. I do believe it starts at the top. I had high hopes for, um, for I can't believe they re elected Hochul. Uh, I thought that um, Zeldin was going to win. I hope, you know, I prayed that he was going to win. And I'm surprised he lost being that not just New York City, but, you know, all of the progressive governors and leaders have their cities go, you know, to shit. And they still keep getting voted in. Uh, I thought that after the, uh, the two police officers were killed last January, I thought that Bragg would, there'd be pressure on him that he'd have to resign or he'd, it wasn't even addressed. The system continues to fail us. We are not safe anymore. Not even the members of the service. I know you were tired of these laws, especially the ones from the new DA. I hope he's watching you speak through me right now. I'm sure all of our blue family is tired too. But I promise, we promise, that your death won't be in vain. 
I love you to the end of time. We'll take the watch from here. Within a couple of weeks, you saw Patty Lynch screaming about it. Um, but within a couple of weeks, nobody was even talking about it. it. It, I don't know how these people get into power and it does start at the top. And that's unfortunate because the progressives are ruining everything. They're not keeping us safe. They're ruining education. They're ruining the economy. They're doing more harm to local cities uh, uh, in addition to just casting a net over the whole country where it's not, it used to be that there was one or two places where they really uh, were soft on criminals, right? Now it's everywhere. When they came out uh, in Illinois, no bail for any crime, basically any crime. We thought that that was crazy and nobody else will follow. And now everybody else is getting in line and they're just, they're just passing more laws that make things worse. And I say to myself, how bad does it have to get before people wake up? I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Not in my lifetime. You know, Paul, I'd like to go back to what you were saying before. You know, you were saying about how, you know, you're shocked to hear also that Chief Madry and Chief Shell are giving different messages to the police department. And you and I were talking offline along with John, how it, could, it just creates complete division. And the department is divided. And John and I were talking about this in depth the other day. And we really do believe that the department is divided. And that's why I think, in my opinion, based on everything that I know about these young rookies running around in khakis, and that they're easily identifiable by these uniforms wearing khakis, I do believe that there are two police departments right now, and Chief Shell is addressing the guys in the khakis. There's two different playbooks right now. The guys in the khakis... Those guys can run around like cowboys and do whatever they want because they're protected by Chief Shell. And the guys in the, in the blue have to play by different rules. But that's only going to – how long will that last before the arm of the DA's office comes after these guys? And I think it's – it's you know, right now I think that Chief Shell is being completely reckless. And when I say reckless because he he's not really thinking uh, down deep about his people. That, hey, yeah, he, maybe he can protect them from CCRB. He could probably protect them from civil lawsuits. He could probably protect them from, from discipline. But he sure as hell cannot protect them from the five borough DA offices and sure as hell he can't protect them from Letitia James. And that is a problem. And, and, and again, I think that these, some of these guys are going to be casualties of war. And I think it's understood in the police department that, hey, we'll lose some of these guys. But we do have to ask questions. It's quite interesting that the mayor has not said a word about car pursuits, and we've had several deaths this year. Chief Madry has not said anything about it. Ch uh, Philip Banks has not said a word about it, but yet we have Chief Shell standing alone on an island by himself saying, rah, 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 let's go out there and do it. Where do you think Adam stands on this? Does he agree more with Madry or Shell? He talks out of both sides of his mouth, so whatever's good. He's a politician. Whatever's good in the news yeah. that day, that's what he'll agree with. If someone got ran over, he's going to be saying, Rock, lock the cops up and we shouldn't be pursuing. If the person got caught, he's going to be wearing his NYPD hat that day. He's, he talks out of both sides of his mouth on every issue. Eric Adams is an incompetent fool. And again, I'll say it. I know we differ on this, Paul, but he is the worst mayor in New York City history. And, and, I, and I think it's de Blasio. I don't, I don't even I don't even think it's close. I don't even think well, it's the other the other thing is De Blasio had eight years to to screw everything up. Adams is only you know he just got started, so maybe uh, I'll change my opinion as time goes by. But I, I think De Blasio started a lot of the nonsense that, that we're dealing with now. And um, so so let, let, let's talk about let's talk about the 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 kids in the khaki pants, right? Because like a lot of rookies say. What Eric said, you know, they I, I, I've had someone send me a message on on Instagram saying there's two departments. There's two different NYPDs, one for the people who wear khaki pants, one for the people who wear blue pants. Now, you know, we've talked about this offline. You know, you're always going to take care of your workers. Right. right? Like I'm going to take care of my workers all the time. I mean, I was taken care of when I was a cop. I brought in a high amount of arrests. 
I was on every pattern. I was on whatever problem this DO was going to have in Comstat. I was going to combat. So were so were the both of you, and and that's you know. So we 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 saw that from the people who supervise us. We passed it down when we supervised others. Right? We took care of those guys. Days off, overtime, uh, more protection. They didn't have to deal with the other sergeants who maybe didn't know as much as you or weren't didn't have the same mission as you in the police department. Um. But what do you think all in all about the CRT? And before you go, I just want to read a message that I got on Instagram. And I'm not going to identify the person. But before both of you go, and and Paul, i like to start with you and then Eric answer. Like, what do you think? Do you think that this is a good good path to have this totally separate uniform? Is this just taking care of workers or there are other things that you're concerned with there? Because I'm going to read you this. It's it's resume versus hook. Worker versus phone call. The people in the precincts doing the job day in and day out in PST slash NST, public safety teams or neighborhood safety teams, those are the guys like the anti-crime teams, the anti-crime yeah. guys, condition guys. In the Conditions, no. Looking for guns. NCO, neighborhood community uh officers addressing conditions and being a liaison for the squad and the guys on conditions, taking all the activity for the command, grinding day in and day out with no protection from chiefs, no phone call and no way out, just working off blood, sweat and tears, trying to make something of themselves to get out of a precinct to the detective bureau are what makes this department function, yet they never get help a lifeline, or what they actually deserve. Nepotism kills leaders, not bosses. Half of you wouldn't be in DB if it was based on running your tax. So I think based on what we talked about offline, we, we agree. You have to take care of the people that work for you, whether it's letting them dress down, whether it's days off, all the stuff that you mentioned. I don't think... It's just a problem of Shell coming to bat for these guys and basically letting them have carte blanche and let them do what they want. I think rather than telling Shell, cut the shit, I think the CO of the command and the other chiefs that you know are, are part of, of the precinct uh, personnel, they need to step it up and say, listen, it's not just these guys in khaki pants that are running around doing – God's work. You guys are are bearing the brunt of this as well. And you got to be given some perks. So rather than just pushing those guys down, I think it'd be better if we elevated the other people up because I was always in a precinct. I was never in a detail, uh, you know, and and I worked my ass off on some of the guys that worked for me. Most of the protection came from the CO. It's his command. He knows you more than some chief will. But I think if we elevate those people and give them more help, let them know they're appreciated, not just with days off and stuff, but maybe it's a modified uniform. Maybe it's out of, you know, out of the bag, totally, whatever. I think we need to help those guys feel more appreciated and reward them. Not just say that shells guys are out of control and they, and they might be, I don't want a 23 year old kid coming in when I'm on the desk, dropping off a prisoner and say, I'll be right back. No way. And it's going to create animosity between, like you said, two police departments, right? These kids are going to be hated. And the worst thing is a rookie with a chip on his shoulder that thinks he knows everything. Because I knew when I was 20, 23 years old, I thought I knew everything, right? Until you turn, until you get much older. So it does divide the command. And Eric, that goes back to what you're saying. You have Madry saying one thing, Shell saying another. You have these cops being treated one way and – the patrol cops being treated uh, another way, but a lot of the patrol cops are doing the same type of work. They need to be rewarded as well. John, I talked about this offline also about the guys in the khakis and after, after discussion, after identifying the things that these guys are doing after several months, especially several, several car accidents, car pursuits that they're involved in have that actually have been fatal. And what we see is, again, two chiefs giving a different message to the same department. 
And I think it's done by design because even before we heard you know, some suspicion that there's two departments within one, we saw it ourselves. We made, we made our own observational skills on it. And I think it's done by design that they're actually wearing these khakis. And this is why. So the guys that are in this unit are brand new. They have zero experience. And they're all, they all come from a line uh, from, uh, it's all about nepotism. They all come from a line, a family line of, of policing. It's, it's a deity. Some of these kids that are in this have had fathers on this job that are chiefs. They've had uncles on this job that are chiefs. So these guys that are put in this unit are put there specifically so that they have protection. They're in a unit where they could go out and do police work. They're being protected by the chief of patrol. They have a legal team with them. They're identifiable by khaki. So the entire department, when these guys are out there, knows who they are and they are untouchable. Stay away from those guys. No supervisor is going to address those guys. Why? It's easily identifiable. You see they're in khakis. They work for Chief Shell. They don't work for a lieutenant. Yeah, some, there's some frontline supervisor in there, but who do they ultimately work for? They work for Chief Shell, who is directly and totally out there supervising them. He's with them. So they have this layer of protection. They are running on different rules. They have a different playbook. So in my opinion, the public safety teams, especially the neighborhood safety team, which is this quasi-anti-crime team, is more there as a mirage and for show. For the public to see, yeah, these guys are out there. They're doing intrusive police work. But they don't have that same level of protection. These guys in khakis are brand new. We're going to get the detective shields because their chiefs are fathers. They're going to be untouchable. I mean, John and I asked this question. Are those guys in khakis wearing body cameras? We're not sure. I think it's a completely different playbook, and they have a complete layer of protection than what this neighborhood safety team guys are. Why are these guys going to get the detective shields? These guys are going to get into units. Eventually, if they can skate by and not go to jail, I'm sure they'll be in a detective squad and they'll be protected and they'll get new guys that are related to chiefs to go in these khakis. But you see, that's that's where I think the problem comes in. It's not just that they're afforded all this. You said they have their own legal team. What, is, what does that mean? They go out with them? Yes. See, why is that not afforded to the precinct cop who's out busting his ass? And, and if the precinct cop has to wear a body camera, why... Why are they exempt from it? So it's not- So they're following the chief. Yeah, so we, we have a chief of patrol. I mean, uh, 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 now he's chief of patrol. What was Shell before he became chief of patrol? What was what was his title? He was just been riding Madri's coattails. I don't know. He, okay. was, he was everything. But, was, but all of everywhere these- where, things, Everywhere where Madri was, he was right behind him. All <laughs> of these things that are afforded, that are afforded to his team should be given to the cops that work just as hard, even though they're even though they're in a different unit, they need to be taken care of as well. It, to me, it's about elevating and helping the workers. Doesn't matter. Well, you you're a worker and you work for Shell, so you're going to get everything you want. I bust my ass. I you know I just work two doubles, and, and I'm in a precinct, so I'm getting nothing. That I think you're going to have a lot of resentment. They're like I said, they're going to be hated. It's incredibly unfair. But I don't think I think the solution is to start helping those other cops that are out doing the same type of work that these guys are doing. And the patrol cops have a short leash, a short lease leash. Right. So if they were in unmarked cars and they were able to dress down and they didn't have body cameras and they had a three star chief backing them, their productivity will go straight up. And so with their morale, because, you know, that you got the back of the people ab above you. That's what I think we need to work on, helping helping the people that are doing just as much work but aren't getting the recognition or the perks that these guys are. Oh, I agree. That's why I think it's done by design that these guys are in khakis and these guys are in blue because they're easily identifiable. Those are the guys that are going to be getting shields and taken care of and actually project their career. The guys in the blue, we're not even looking at those guys. Yeah. Totally. That's exactly what's going on. Guys, uh, if you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe. Turn on the notifications. Hit the bell. It'll help us move up in the rankings if you enjoy our content. We'll be right back at you in a minute. I want to talk about why. Paul touched on this a minute, but I just, want to, I just want to get Eric's thoughts on why you believe young rookies were put into Shell's main unit where supposedly they have the training and experience 
to go after these car pursuits. If you have any financial questions, if you're looking at any financial products, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend you getting life insurance. I highly recommend you getting investing in your future. You make enough money. You could afford all the things you want to afford. You don't want to afford to have money in the future or you want to afford to have an expensive car that you're driving right now and no money in your pocket later on down the road. Choice is yours. Reach out to Laid Law Blue if you want to secure your financial future. Law enforcement professionals dedicate their lives to serving and protecting our community. But who's protecting their financial futures? That's where Laid Law Blue comes in. Our wealth management platform is specifically designed for the law enforcement community. Laidlaw Blue is a division within Laidlaw Wealth Management run by retired New York City detective John McDermott. His status as a retired detective uniquely positions him to establish a deep connection between Laidlaw Blue and the law enforcement community. Our platform is easy to use and provides a range of financial services, including investment management, retirement planning, and insurance solutions. With Laidlaw Blue, you can secure your financial future and provide for your loved ones. Our team of experienced financial advisors understands the unique challenges and opportunities that law enforcement professionals face. We're here to help you navigate the complexities of financial planning and achieve your goals. Laidlaw Blue, secure your financial future today. Book a meeting using the QR code displayed or call us directly on 888-901-BLUE. That's 888-901-BLUE. Outstanding. Paul, you want to go first or? Uh... Well, I like I said before, I think the reason why he picked these young kids is because they could be molded and maybe manipulated. It's going to get harder to get a guy with 18 years on to chase someone for paper plates than it is a guy who just came out of the academy who doesn't really know what he's doing. Um, They want the war stories. They want the camaraderie. They want to feel like they're special. Their adrenaline is flowing. They think it's great. They think it's like, this is like TV. This is exactly what I, they haven't gotten, they haven't visited the trial room yet. They haven't been, uh, the subject of all the CCRBs, like like you did, like you were uh, subjected to, Eric, you know, from doing great police work. So um, I think they're easy to manipulate uh, simply because maturity and discipline and, and all those other things that wisdom, right? It doesn't come at that age and it certainly doesn't come with that, uh, with a cop that has so little experience. So I think that's done not just because of the CCRBs, but because they're easy to control. No, I, I definitely agree that element is definitely part of it. But I think that the main focus, I think ultimately what it comes down to is the 58. And I think that's why they pick these young guys. They pick these young guys twofold, two reasons. First, they pick these young guys because there's a deity for most of them. They're related to chiefs. They're related to people on the job. So immediately, these guys are grabbing – they grabbed not too far, not too far along after doing the police academy. So they have a clean slate, a clean record. They could put them into this unit. They could go out and do intrusive police work. They could run around like may- maniacs, but they have a layer of protection from the legal team, Chief Shell. So they're protected from the civilian complaint review board. They're protected from civil liability. And then these guys could get promoted to detective. And then eventually put them on the put them out in their careers in a squad or some other unit, and their 58 is never tainted. So they they still have a clean record, but they still have a record to show that they were doing real police work. They have arrest, they have situations, they have stories to tell, they have a resume, but they don't have the 58. Unlike the guys that are in the blue pants who are doing the neighborhood safety teams and the public safety. Those guys would grab young also because they may have a, a minimal or a nominal amount of CCRBs, but they're in a position where they're, those guys are going to become casualties. They're going to go out there. They're going to run around to the intrusive police work, and they know that C- let CCRB attack those guys to stay away from the khakis. I think there was some type of deal made with CCRB. Don't attack these guys in khakis. These guys are special. They're in with the crew. 
Go after the guys with the blue. We'll give you the guys in the blue. You can taint their records. And when those guys' records are tainted and they can't go anywhere, they'll just get a new batch of guys and put them in the blue. That's my opinion on this. So we put out a meme. The reason we did this episode again, because me and Eric talked about vehicle pursuits. There's been numerous articles written about that podcast since that time. Um, the reason we're talking about this again is because everybody was asking us to talk about it. We put out a meme about showing Chief John Shell and a car lighting on fire, and it said the Fall Guy starring Chief John Shell. Uh, pretty popular. Everybody was laughing about it. It got sent around like a million times everywhere throughout the entire department. I'm sure even Shell himself took, had a good laugh about it. Um, but I think it really tells a tale. And, and shout out to Alamo Defender one on Twitter. He's been Great. putting out all these memes. You know, all the video editing has been done through Paul and all the memes have been done through Alamo on Twitter. He's unbelievable. Uh, we're going to have him on one day to reveal himself and give you his story and why he's working with us as well. Um, but I, I do believe at the end of the day, I do believe at the end of the day, that is an accurate picture of what John Shell is. I think it should be the bully and the fall guy because I think he is bullying every other boss on the job, including the CEOs and lieutenants and the sergeants out there to not touch my guys like we would have done as sergeants and lieutenants. But I think it should be done at that level and not at his level. I think it should be done between the sergeants and the lieutenants to protect their guys and even the CEOs of, of units to protect their guys. Not a, not a three-star chief. Um, so I think that's, that's, you know, that's upending morale and affecting the thing. But the reason I say that is I think that we don't hear we don't hear from uh what's the police commissioner's name i don't even know anymore because we never hear ed ed caban right ed (laughs) caban who's who's the 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 face the face of the police commissioner we don't hear from the real police commissioner phil banks and we don't hear from chief jeffrey madry on this because at the end of the day when it goes bad i personally believe john shell will be shown the door he will be just another compliant old white man that, that refuses to see the big picture. Paul, what do you think about what I just said? First of all, that takes me back to the NYPD has an image problem, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the biggest problem that they're they're going to have with Shell is that he's a white guy, an old white guy, because Eric Adams basically said it. The NYPD has a great crime fighting profile but it has an image problem when you look at the department you don't see youthfulness you don't see the diversity at the top if you're not a person of color there there must be something wrong with you Uh, i just want to tell you this quick story we were um i don't want to say what command i was in but co told me we're getting a new guy He's 400 pounds, but he's really good. That's, that's how he said it. He said he's, he's tremendously obese, but he's great. And I remember saying, wow, that's like you had to preface that by saying the guy's completely out of shape, but he's really good because the perception is if you're 400 pounds, you really can't do this job. And the more I started to think about it, I said, you know, what? and I was, I was always heavy. So I, I, the more I started thinking about it, I said, you know, he's right. If you're, Obese, uh, uh, if, you, if you got an extra 100 pounds on you, you can't run after someone. You, you know, you'll be huffing and puffing. You can't run upstairs. You can't chase perps down. But he had to, he had to put that in the statement, which is he, he's more than what he looks like. He's good, right? Now we're at a situation where you're doing that on race. Like I could imagine Eric Adams appointing a white guy and have to explain to everyone else he's white, but he's good. I never thought we would get to a point where a physical attribute and your ability to run after someone, which is understandable, can now change into simply the color of your skin. And it works both ways. Because now if someone was saying, we're getting a new guy and he's black, you'd have to say, but he's not a diversity hire. He's actually good. Just like we're getting a white guy, but he's actually good. So I agree with you 100% about Chief Shell. He's uh, he's the odd man out. The only question I have is he's already a three-star chief. 
what's in it for him to do this? Is it life after the PD? Is, is it, is it a book? Like I could see an inspector, you know, or, or a DI trying to do this to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. He's already almost maxed out. What, why would he be doing this if um, he just wasn't interested in cleaning up the, cleaning up these, uh, these areas? And so I've gotten to watch him talk several times in these press conferences. I, I saw him at the, at the riots. And, and I, think, I think when it comes to him particularly, obviously I'm making an observation, I think it comes down to a huge ego. I think that he's just an egomaniac. I, I really honestly, from what I see, I, like you said, he's a three-star. He's a three-star chief. He's. I, he has to know at this point after he stood there when they promoted uh, Ed Caban, when they appointed him to the commissioner and Tiny Kinsella to the first step, that clearly he's not part of that crew and he's not going anywhere else. I just think he's a, just completely egotistical, and I just think that honestly, he doesn't even realize that he is the fall guy or the bully. I, I think it's sad, right, right, John? I really. You know, 100%. You know, Paul, I, honestly, Paul, I love hearing the stuff that you're saying because it's so honest and so real because you're you're talking about your experiences from 92 to 2008. And, and the department right now is so different right now. I mean, it, even, I, I, John, you can probably agree, right? Like 2018 was a completely different department than 2017. Every year, it just got more bizarre. Right, John? 100%. Yeah. It was the downfall yeah. of the NYPD. Thank you. Dude. Thank you, Commissioner Shea, for being a compliant white man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for watching this podcast, too. Thank you. Big shout out to Tanya Meisenholder and Wendy Garcia for watching this podcast and following, too. Appreciate it. I don't know if you saw this, but Tanya was wearing uh, – Tanya had a, a picture. I don't know. All of a sudden, she's a Bronx girl at the Morrisania uh, Housing Development, which I used to work in the confines of the 4-2 for PSA 7. She was there wearing a blue shirt and khaki. So, again, it's clearly obvious that if you're wearing the khakis, you're part of the elite. You guys mentioned this on a, on a prior podcast about the white shirts going out. Uh, it wasn't the Union Square riot. It was something else. And <clears throat> you were saying that you could tell that these guys are not the new breed of cops that they have. They all have 30 years on. They all came on in the 90s. And they're all out there, rah, rah, you know, we're going to lock everybody up. I agree. They looked foolish. They looked ridiculous, right? But I also like that they were out there. When I was getting promoted to lieutenant, my friend uh, Frank, uh, we were in the youth office and he was saying, uh, Paul, I know how you are. I know how you are. You know, don't be the idiot that yells charge and you're the only guy running and the cops are standing behind you. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say um, it's important that it's important <laughs> that the, the leadership stay with the police officers. If I'm going to ask you to do something, I've done it and I'm willing to do it again. So in that sense, it was nice that they weren't in the, the THV in the air conditioning, you know, telling all these cops what to do. I think you should be out there with them, not necessarily on the front line. Right. Obviously, you don't do that in the military. You'll be taken out. All, all, all the big wigs will be taken out, right? But at least there, they look like a bunch of clowns. They look, you know, stupid. But that also goes back to no manpower, right? You had more white shirts than you had cops. But I, I did like that that they were out there with their officers. Do you guys? Uh, did you ever work with Chief Anamone? I don't know when he retired. No, but I I heard the stories about him. So, I heard the stories about him. The comp said, "Yeah, and he was. I've heard. Uh, I only saw him at comp stat. I saw him a couple of other times. I heard he was a nut. That he would a great nut though. A great guy. A great cop. That he would stop if he saw a cop doing a car stop. He would get out and help the cop, or or he would you know stand there and and make sure that the cop uh, didn't need any help. He never he, you know he never broke anybody's balls. Uh, this is." my my uh you know how i remember him he sounds like chief shell because he was all like a cowboy and he wanted to clean up uh clean up the city but again it was under a different administration but i think if if eddie could get on the same page with shell 
like you said, having a split department is not a good thing. If more people would come out and do this and it became the norm, I think that maybe we would get uh, a couple of DAs in there, maybe that would at least have some common sense and not let these, these rapists off the hook and maybe back their cops. But a lot of it has to do with, I think, when we came on compared to when, when you guys came on. And you guys came on in 04, right? So yeah. you were saying that 17 and 18, even that one year was a big difference, right? Every and, year it's getting more bizarre. So I, I want to touch on that. In, in my, um, when I came on in 92, I was talking to my friend who came on in 89, 89, right? Just, just three years earlier. And I forgot how it came up, but he said, yeah, if a guy's, if a guy's yelling, uh, fuck the police, you discon his ass. You don't let him say that in front of you. And I'm like, just got out of the academy. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. I said, all right. And he was genuine and, and we, you know, we're great friends. He wouldn't stand me wrong. When I was doing field training, they had transit and, and housing lateral. So we, I worked with this other guy who was great. He came on in 91, just two years difference. And he heard me say that. And he goes, whoa, 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 Paul, if someone says, fuck the police, you don't discon him. I'm like, but my buddy told me that you do. He goes, no, not today. Not today. It was only two years difference. He goes, that's just speech, man. Let it go. Let it roll off your back. Just those two years made a big difference. So you're talking like I'm out 15 years now. I don't recognize half the stuff that's going on. You know, you, you guys have much more. You have your, your finger on the pulse of, of the job. And guys that, guys that are still on are communicating with you. All of my friends are out. We're all retired. Thankfully, we all made it. So um, it does change year to year, and that's unfortunate too. I want, I want to piggyback off what you said. You know, I, so I went to officer school, the Marine Corps, which is OCS, Officer Ken School, and um, I actually went on to grad. I wanted to, I wanted to be, a, originally my plan was to be a life in the Marine, so I wanted to be an officer. And one thing you learn in the Marine Corps is lead from the front. You don't lead in the rear with the gear. So that, that I ex I expect them to be out there with the guys. What I said was very ridiculous and idiotic. And I'm glad we're talking about this, Paul. What I think is idiotic is that all the leaders are in one spot. One spot. At the same yeah. Point. Yeah. With the plywood. And, and, and learned, exactly. And what I learned in the Marine Corps, that is a horrible tactic. All you need is a sniper to take them out, and you just took out the whole upper echelon, right. and now the decision-making is gone. Yes, if, if I'm a special operations lieutenant, I'm out there with my team, I should be leading from the front. If you're... If you're a chief, yes, you should be leading the the charge at the entire riot. But three chiefs and 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 four inspectors should not be in the same spot that they're a team and they're going to go out and make arrests. It's absolutely ridiculous. I agree. I agree. One hundred percent. It looked it looked like a clown show. I just want to say something though. I like that they were out there, but that was the only thing I liked. What I saw out there from them was not leadership. It was do as I say, not as I do. Again, not one of them had a body camera on. We and Eric talked about the inspector and the cop who put the kid up against the car and the window shattered. Yeah. When that window shattered, what do you see? You see a three-star chief of transit right next to them. And what does he do? He walks away from them Kemper. and doesn't look in their direction. Yeah. That is no not, eye contact. That is complete cowardice. I'm sorry. And, and what are they doing? They're locking people up and passing them off. And you're basically, what is that? That's a DP. That's a decline yes. prosecution. Yes. That's a decline prosecution. I didn't see leadership in that riot at all. I'm I'm happy that they were out there because it takes it takes a man to go out into the fray, regardless of how you're doing it, what your thoughts or fears are, what your belief is, or your ethos. You're out there. So I commend you for that. You're not Eric Adams hiding behind the desk. You're not like, you're not, you're actually out on the street. You're not just passing out flyers, a part of an organization, an anti-police organization while you're a cop. You're actually out on the street spewing your own bullshit. But they didn't, they didn't do, they didn't exhibit leadership. Because again, what would happen to a cop if they didn't have their body camera on? If somebody's head and I and I again I said it prior. I think it shattered because the kids prior that they were chasing shattered yeah. that window, and through the pressure of him going up against the car, the window shattered. It was already shattered. 
um, what would happen to a cop if he kept walking in that video? They would that would be replayed over and over mm -hmm. again. Inspections and internal affairs. You know, there would be numerous allegations against that cop who just kept walking. Yeah, but there will be nothing well, for three star. Teams. No, no, it's uh, it's chief immunity. I don't know if you guys were on the job during the Puerto Rican Day Parade where all hell broke loose. It was, um, I, it may have been the early 2000s. You know what? It was probably before 9-11, um, where these guys were just throwing water on these girls. And uh, it, was, it was really like, it, was, it wasn't a riot, but it was really out of hand. And they showed cop after cop doing nothing about it. And that was, that was the real issue. It was all over the news. It was on every paper. They covered it for weeks and months. So, yeah, if, you, if you're a cop, if you're not in a white shirt and you look the other way, you're jammed up. But that's why I like that it was an inspector that, that grabbed the kid. He was a white shirt, right? I like that instead of him saying, grab this guy, he went out and did it. Because that's the way I was taught. That's what I would do. You have to lead, and you don't lead from behind. I call that following. You lead from the front. So it was good to see them out there, but you're 100% right. They were all in one cluster. You know, it was, it was embarrassing, really, to see them like that. But again, there's, somebody has to say, hey, split up, right? They weren't prepared for it. As you, as you guys said on the other podcast, it was, a, it was Intel dropped the ball. They should have been prepared for it. They weren't. And it, it looked, you know, Madri got hit in the face uh, with something. So, but I'm glad that, you know what, it's not just cops taking the fire. It's, I don't ever want to see any cop get hurt, but I'm tired of only cops getting hurt and, and the chiefs are in the THV and they don't come out uh, until it's over. So it was good to see them there. They just didn't handle it well. And maybe they were there because of poor leadership. Maybe they were there because... They didn't know anything was going to go down. They didn't know it would be in that area. They thought they had enough cops, and they, and they didn't. Leadership is, is a big thing. Eric, I know you talk about the books you've read about it. And speaking of the poor leadership, where does Eddie Caban stand on the vehicle pursuits? Like, he should be the dividing line, right? You got one chief saying this, him saying the other. Adams is quiet. I don't see Eddie speak. Just, you know, like you guys mentioned it. Where's Eddie? He, he doesn't seem to be around. Well, we drew, we drew two conclusions. Either he's silenced because he's incompetent and he's self-aware of that, or he's silenced by Mary, Mary Eric Adams because the one who's really calling the shots, as we know, is Philip Banks. And he's keeping him silenced because he knows he's incompetent. So it's one or the other. Yeah, but Banks and Adams still aren't speaking about it. Somebody's got to be a leader and say, you know, it can't just be Shell all on an island like Before the thumbnail, I, right? It's the bully Ma guy. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you guys? But look, seriously, like, I, I get it. You, I like that they were out there. I agree with you. What do you think? If you were a chief on this job, would you wear a body camera when all your guys are, is that leadership? If what my guys, if my guys are wearing it, I'm wearing it. When I when I got to the seventh precinct, uh, I remember parking outside, and the cops and, and the other supervisors were saying, "Oh, there's indoor parking for supervisors." I said, I'm going to par park out here with the cops. And he said, yeah, but they slash tires and stuff. I said, what am I special? If, if these guys have to deal with it, then let me deal with it. And I parked outside for like maybe the first year or two. And then I eventually came inside because it just got – guys were parking on the sidewalk. And then, you know, communications came down. The, the, you know, Manicone's parked outside when he should be parked inside. So I eventually had to do it. But you have to put yourself – you leadership isn't just, the, in my opinion – Leadership isn't just about leading, but it's about saying that, look, I had a lucky Saturday, all right? Sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. I passed all three tests. I'm no different than you. The only thing is I, I, I took these promotions, but I'm, I'm going to – it doesn't mean that I'm smarter than them. And if the cops are wearing – if the cops are, are, are hindered in some type of way, you should not be exempt – just because you're a chief. If they're wearing a body camera, you should wear a body camera. When uh, a couple of days after 9-11 when we were doing search and rescue, there were a couple of cops that didn't have a flashlight. So I gave my flashlight away. And they had this thing that you would break and it would illuminate. It would, they said it's, it's only good to find your body, basically. It only lasted for six hours. 
So I had two and a couple of cops I didn't know on a different detail. They had none. So I didn't just give one away. I gave two away because you want to help the cops that you're with. That's why I became a boss. To The higher you go, the more help you can provide mm -hmm. these people. And if the cops are wearing a, a body cam, you have to be wearing one. Why do you, but before Eric, before you go, why do you think, Paul, why do you think that they're not? Number one, they think they're above, they're above it. They don't want to get jammed up. Um, they, they think they're exempt and nobody's even going to, who's going to tell them to put it on? If you're a three-star chief, who's going to say, Eddie's going to come over and say, put your camera on. So uh, they'll, they'll say, I'm not an enforcement, uh, you know, whatever, whatever decision, whatever reason they're going to give, but they think they're exempt. And that's not a true leader. A true leader is you do it. I do it. You know, I've, uh, printed prisoners. I've sat on prisoners at hospitals. It didn't matter what rank I was. I would sit on a foot post so a cop could go home early. And I'd say, don't worry, I'll, get, I'll give it special attention. That was the best thing about being a boss, helping other cops. If they're doing something, you should be doing it too. I think, I think what you said is fantastic. I think that leaders are supposed to set the example and they're supposed to be influential. And I think that the best leaders don't even, even have to say what to do. Oh, they have others do things because they're influential by what they do. So, for instance, when I was special operations lieutenant, we had several, several offices for the cops. When the garbage had to be thrown out, when the garbage was full, I wouldn't say, hey, listen, can someone go throw it out? I would go walk over to the garbage and start wrapping it up to yeah. throw it out. And the guys would see that, and then they would come over and grab it for me or help me. That's what leaders do. They set the example. So absolutely, if I was a chief, I would say 1,000% that every chief, anyone on this job, if you're out there in a field enforcement manner, you're out there in the street wearing a uniform of the day, if the cops have to be strapped with a body camera, so should you. It's called uniform, which means we're all the same. And that's what I take so much pride when I was in the Marine Corps, especially in the Marine Corps. They used to say, what do you call a general in the Marines and also a private? You call them both Marine. It didn't matter. They were proud. You could call a general Marine. They're all the same. Just some are leading Marines. And that just should be the same thing. And that's why I used to tell the guys on a job, we're all cops. Some of us lead cops. Great. I love that. Eric, Eric same question, though. Same question. <laughs> why do you think the Chiefs aren't wearing body cameras? Oh, because I think that they play by a complete different rule book and that they, they are aware. They're exactly aware of what's going on with the legislation and the politics and the CCRB, and they do not want to be recorded. They want to be exempt from any discipline and any civil liability or any chance of the DA's office coming after themselves. So they give themselves that layer of protection where the cops don't have it. Not fair. It's not fair. No. Yeah. I, I personally think that it just highlights the fact of what me and Eric have been saying, that these body cams <coughs> reduce minor complaints against yourself. They never were. They were only set up for police accountability and to keep for public safety, to keep the public safe from police. And they are there to hurt cops. That, that's why we're using it. I'm not saying that they couldn't be a good tool and, and we can't use them, but that's not how they're being used in New York City. They're being used as a punitive scrutinizing measure, and they are unwilling to put themselves under the same microscope that they themselves put the average rank and file of the NYPD under. They're absolute cowards. They're absolutely cowardly. They're not leaders. That's why you never hear me say NYPD leadership. If you look at my posts, it always says NYPD managers or NYPD management, appointed management, because that's what they are. They're not leading by example. It's an absolute disgrace. I don't feel bad for any of them. Essex got shown the door. I'm hearing Pontillo's getting shown the door. I don't feel bad for any of them. I really don't. Well, John, this you said this on another podcast. We made a short out of it. The difference between FD and our job is a, a boss in the fire department would say, put me, up, put me back in the firehouse. Put me on a rig. I don't care. I'll fight a fire. That's what I do best. But a chief will never do that because they know that the cop's job is not sustainable. 
You cannot work on the, under the conditions we are asking our officers to work under. They're constantly scrutinized from people who have the ability to forward frame by frame and say, you did this wrong, you should have done this. And it got, it, it, it's at a point now where the body camera would normally corroborate um, or confirm a suspicion or something that you saw. And then if it wasn't on the body camera, you would say, okay, it just didn't pick it up. They've now switched it to say, well, now it's not on the body cam, you're lying. So John, I agree hundred percent. It's only meant, it's another tool to go after our, our cops. And it's not surprisingly, but it's disgusting. I, I agree. I've said this on, on prior podcasts. I think that the body cameras protect you from major allegations, but not minor, not minor issues. You know, I, I've used this uh, scenario uh, prior. I'll use it again. If the three of us were working together in a patrol car and we were transporting female prisoners and we're, we're armed to the teeth with body cameras, if she makes an allegation of rape, clearly it's going to exonerate us. That's a major incident. But a minor incident when we're involved in a scuffle like that inspector putting someone against a car in the middle of a riot, if you have the body camera, that's going to give a different perception. It's never going to look good and, and it's not in your favor. Yeah, I know that... Um... You guys were touching on Eric Adams saying that police work doesn't look pretty. Um, and sometimes, you know, that's just, that's just what it comes down to. <clears throat> it never looked, <clears throat> excuse me. It never looks pretty. People don't go quietly. They don't go, you know, a lot of them fight and sometimes it gets violent. Um, I do remember in the police Academy where they, we went away from the nightstick and we went to the PR 24 Right. For, for those that don't know, that's the nightstick with the handle. And we were told the reason why they did that is because they wanted to get out of this. They wanted to get out of people seeing cops do this and hit, pe hit people with the wood. Eric's famous photo. That's been I know. I know. It's just, it's just going like to go into that. Yeah. So, <laughs> Eric, you know that when you're holding the PR 24 up, it's if it would feel a lot different than holding the hickory or whatever that wood is. Uh, so perception is important. They also got away from, there used to be a little thing like this. It was made of rubber. It's called a slapper. <laughs> it's, it was, I, I didn't have that when I came on, they had gotten rid of it, but you know, you just slap someone in the face with it. I was told, I don't know, but they got rid of that because it didn't look good. Uh, uh, you know, that didn't look good either. So there, there is something to be said that police work isn't, isn't pretty. And some of the things that you see on a body camera, are never going to look good. You know, the cop that was in, I believe it was in Staten Island where you guys did a podcast and, and the, the perp said, I bit the cop or I punched the cop in the face. Punched she admitted face. it. Numerous times. But all you see is him striking her. That's never going to look good. You got you to get the whole story though. And if you pulled his body camera, even if you saw her strike him, that's not going to be on the news, right? So- Body cameras, there's a kind of a necessary evil. If you had an honest department and people that actually back their police officers, it could be a good tool to use uh, in court or to, like you said, Eric, exonerate cops. Unfortunately, they, they twisted it and, and put, this in, they put this square peg in the round hole and they're just forcing it in as another, another way to hang cops. And that's you know, very disheartening. Yeah, no. A Eric Adams said it didn't look good. It didn't look good. I mean, right. Eric did a podcast and we titled it Police Work is a Contact Sport. It doesn't look pretty on camera. And Never. I think uh, the leftist Hellgate paper wrote about it. And they basically accused me and Eric of advocating for police to use force and violence. And that's not what we said. We just said that when violence is deployed, it's never going to look good. So in right. what standard of it doesn't look good, police work never looks good. But So it's easy for someone who wore a uniform but never actually did the job of a police officer to say, oh, it didn't look good. Yeah, it didn't look good because it probably didn't look good from the desk either and it didn't sound good and you didn't like to see these things because you never actually partook in it. So it's easy to be the judge. I could watch UFC every Saturday and say all the things I would do in that cage 
but I probably wouldn't do any of them. I'd probably be laying on the floor with my teeth knocked out, getting sent to the ambulance in 0.3 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's the same is true for Eric Adams, like his statement. So I just think, I just think it's uh you know, like I said, I just think that it's being used completely wrong. Yep. I, gotta, I gotta start to wrap this up, even though the NYPD said that I'm not religious and denied my religious beliefs. I do have to go to church today, <laughs> so if we could like just if we could start to close this out, you know, uh, I, I think this is a good podcast. I think this is great food for thought. Um, I you know I'd love to have you back on again on, on a lot of other topics, Paul. You know, you're very knowledgeable. You come from a totally totally different uh, era that we do. Not so far apart. You know, we're cut from the same cloth. We believe the same things we have the same values um so but i i really do appreciate your honest perspective it's it's great to hear and you know i i you know and so i appreciate you know you coming on and being willing to be brave enough to discuss it like you do on your channel just right pd right you you spill your heart out in defense of cops in defense of this country and i really uh implore anyone that follows us on youtube to go over to at just right pd and follow paul as well he makes great videos they're from the heart. You know, again, none of us are doing this for the, the money. <laughs> we don't make any money doing it. <laughs> this is all from the heart. This is all just therapy for us. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. It is therapy. Absolutely. Yeah. Dude, uh, thank you. That was very nice of you to say those, those kind words. Yeah, for me, it is therapy because, you know, before I became sergeant, I, you know, you have a choice. How do I help cops? And you can help cops by going the delicate route. But it didn't matter, even if you made it up to the PBA president, the decision to help cops, the, the ability to help cops always came down to a boss. You can be a delegate, but if the cop needs a week off or the night off because he's got child care issues or something, he still has to get permission from the CO or from the desk officer or for someone. So I went the supervisor route, not just to you know, uh, uh, ascend in a job that I loved, but I felt like it was a delegate on steroids because now I have the authority to sign the 28 and get the cops that I work with off. And I, when I became a lieutenant, I could do the same for sergeants. And then obviously if captain, the same, if you had a command, you, I mean, you could help hundreds of people. So when I retired, <clears throat> I lost that. I became Joe Civilian, Joe Schmo, And there was nothing, there was no method of me to, help anyone anymore. So I kind of lost myself for a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I, I lost the, the uh, satisfaction of always helping my fellow officers. When I created the YouTube channel, it was right after George Floyd because I couldn't take what was being done to our police officers in the media, uh, how these poor cops were getting assaulted. So it is like, just to finish up what mm -hmm. you were saying, it absolutely is a therapy for me because I feel like I'm doing something positive for the men and women that are still on the job. And that's, that's the most rewarding feeling that uh, I could ask for. And thank you again for having me on. It was a pleasure. Uh, Paul, it's always a pleasure talking to you offline by text, talking to you on the phone. You've been so supportive of this podcast from day one when we didn't even know you and you were just, giving us support on social media. When I, when I was brand new to social media, I never use it. I, I mean, I, I still, I'm still learning. I'm still, it's still in its embassy for me, but I, I just want to say thank you so much for joining the team. The stuff that you do for us, the video production, you put your heart and soul into it. Uh, to the public out there, I just want to tell you, uh, Paul really is a perfectionist. I mean, there's it's plenty of stuff that I think could be done probably in, in maybe two, three hours if it was me and John, but he's a total perfectionist and he really puts his time and effort so we get these videos perfect. He spends hours on them. I, I, Paul, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm so appreciative. Thank you for taking the time. I always love hearing your perspective. And of course, Paul's wearing us, uh, supporting the podcast, wearing the 265 Police Live shirt, New York's Finest Unfiltered. Still available at Myers in person in Staten Island, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. You can also get it online. We'll have the link up at the site. So, please, everyone, thank you so much for the support. we got some good content coming out tonight. The episode in regards to South Greco's lawsuit update will be out. We have another episode coming out talking about mental health. And then we have another one coming out, which I think is going to be great, where we, uh, we're we going to have a conversation with a, a doctor that wrote a book called Surviving Retirement. It's some great info, especially – uh, relates to us. Here we are in retirement. And for those that told us, just disappear and stop talking. Uh, go enjoy your retirement. 
what we are, and we enjoy doing this, right? Yeah. So thank you so much for taking this venture with me. Uh, 265 Police Live, New York's Finest for China Filter Podcast. John McCarry, Paul Manicone, Eric Dib, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. <laughs>